optimism now it tells a different story. An experiment that's failed, or one that deserves another shot. The Juvenile Boot Camp, on this edition of Two Process. Major funding for Two Process is made possible by the New Jersey State Bank Foundation, committed to educating the public about the law. Additional funding is provided by Gloria and troubled teens into shape. But since then, the juvenile boot camp has taken a drilling of its own. I'm Raymond Brown, and on the docket for this edition of Due Process, the boot camp reappraised. We'll hear from all sides of the boot camp debate, from the state's director of juvenile justice to a criminal justice professor who calls the boot camp an experiment that has failed. But first, here's Sandy Cook. Raymond, there have been naysayers since the start who claim the boot camp was no more than a quick fix bound to fail. And they got plenty of support last year when the first comprehensive study of New Jersey's juvenile boot camp found that boot camp graduates were no less likely to commit new crime. The recidivism rates for delinquents who went to youth jails and those who went to boot camp, virtually the same. It's 9 a.m. at Gordon Track, and these kids have been up for hours. When we wake up at 5.30 in the morning, Six o'clock, we get outside, do some exercises for like an hour. Every now and then, we go on a team for a mile run. Come back, we may take a shower. All that before breakfast. <laughs> because this is New Jersey's first and only juvenile boot camp. <laughs> the state's attempt to add a little tough love to a lot of discipline, the aim a quick fix for juvenile delinquents. It's modeled after the military boot camp. From the uniforms and precision drills to the buzz cuts. And the two-inch neatness of every last bunk. We all got to be, we all in it, we got to be the same in it. Why do you think that is? I don't know, I really don't have no idea. But whether or not they can tell you why, the so-called cadets know just what's expected of every minute of every day. For the six-month stretch, they will call this place home. Get dressed for school, go to school four or five hours a day, come back, maybe work, cut grass, go on a work detail. And it is all in stark contrast to the lives they led before. Home, just sleep all day, and go out when I want to. The idea, of course, to break those old habits and make new, improved ones. They teach you responsibility how to get up in the morning, do what you got to do. And when you go home, when you have a job, you're going to have to get up, go to work. You know what I'm saying? You might not like it, but you're going to have to do it. So that's what, they, that's what they teach you here. And yet that teaching somehow doesn't stick. While they're here, they stay in step. And even in their first year out, they tend to do better than the kids released from the old-style juvenile jail. The problem is what happens after that. After the first year, our recidivism rate catches up with the kids coming out of residential programs and institutions. And that recidivism rate is shocking. By the end of the second year back on the street, 80% rearrested, 68% convicted, of another crime. Our kids leave here with a lot of enthusiasm, with a lot of goals. I think after the first year, I think they start to give up when things don't materialize for them out in the, out in the community, if they're still struggling or trying to find a job or struggling in school. 
struggling for the most part with little support, mostly on their own, without the intensive aftercare that experts say may make the difference in programs like these. When you get into college, you get a good job. I plan on, you know, furthering my education. See, I plan on going to the Navy, and I'm trying to get out as fast as I can before I, before anything even come down. Most of these kids will just go back to the same streets that they came from. I think they start to give up. I think peer pressure starts to get uh, back to them after a year. The streets has got that, that, that hold on them. They're always out late, they're always partying, drinking, just doing negative things. Sir, all present count for sir. If you get in trouble, that's on you. I think the boot camp, the boot camp is good. They feed you good. They make you do business. They teach you a whole bunch of stuff here, how to you know, respect all that. But when you get out, it's, it's up to you. The boot camp with its young cadets, population today stands at 72, cost New Jersey $4 million a year, a little less than the per bed cost of the traditional juvenile lockup. But does it do a better job? Well, despite those disturbing recidivism rates, the kids do make educational gains, an average two-year reading jump in just six months. And the kids will tell you they feel changed by the boot camp experience. The problem is that two years later, the stats tell a totally different story. So some states have already closed their boot camps, and some experts here think New Jersey should do the same. Others say the boot camp deserves another chance. We'll hear why from both sides when we come back, so stay with us. adjust to a different kind of lifestyle and not really change. Lisa gives them some discipline, they can learn something, and they're around people that are trying to do better. Because when you put them away in a prison, they're around bad people to learn bad habits. It's a better idea than putting them uh, in prison. Or in a, in a, it's a better idea, much better idea. I don't believe in, in severe discipline, but I think they need some discipline in their lives that they may not be getting elsewhere. I don't think it's going to do much. Kids will behave uh, while they're in the boot camp, but I don't think that it's going to have any long-lasting effect. Everyone wants to make a difference on delinquency, but where does the boot camp fit in that goal? For some answers, we turn to Howard Beyer, New Jersey's Director of Juvenile Justice, the man in charge of the boot camp, and Travis Pratt, Assistant Professor at the Rutgers School of Criminal Justice, who turns thumbs down on the boot camp. Welcome to both of you. Well, I got to start with you. Um, you now are in the position, and you're going to either have to make a decision or have a discussion with the governor. And what are you going to say? Keep the boot camp or not in light of the controversy and the very mixed and highly critical reviews of boot camp? Well, I strongly believe that we should keep the boot camp. Um, there is a lot of a lot of success that has come out of it, and we, we particularly have to look at the period of time that the kids are in the program. And I, we have to remember that we're talking about kids, kids who are going to go back to their communities, kids who are going to be in a program for an extended period of time, six months. And that during that period of time, while they are in the boot camp, we have to do the very best job that we can with those kids, realizing that they are going back to difficult communities in some cases. The issue is, is that then we have to be proactive in dealing with with those kids, those communities, those parents, those faith groups, those prosecutors, those police departments, um, we're gonna and dealing with them uh, when, they, when they are released. We're, we're going to come back to follow-up, and that's important. And there obviously are many different criteria you could look at to get a picture of boot camps, but I suspect the one of greatest concern to the public is, does it have an effect on recidivism? Are these kids going back? And the study last year indicated that they 
they seem to go back into the justice system at the same rate as kids who are not in boot camp. Or they just given that, or given that study, what's your feeling about how effective this is at the core question of whether this is going to keep them from going back to jail? Well, I, I think at the first year they seem to do a little bit better than the kids who came out of the, the other structured environments that uh, that the, the Juvenile Justice Commission and the board. But I think there's, I think one of the most important things that we do uh, in the commission is that we provide hope and that we, we should never, ever turn our backs on the, on the children because really what we're talking about are children who have come into a system that is really the last step. But are we talking about what's the best way to deal with the children in the context of getting them ready for society? Right. And we, what we do is provide a very structured environment with trained staff who provide guidance and direction as to how they should live their lives that it, that should never come, should ever be taken away from them. And they're there, and while they are there, they do get that. Um, what we would like to see is that the, the things that are instilled in those kids, or in our, with our kids while we have them, that, that when they leave, they take that with them. Now, I believe they do take that with them. And how do we maintain the spirit that they leave with to, to follow them through once they're back in the community? And that's what I think we have to talk about. Let, let me bring Professor Brennan into the story. Um, you've been very critical of boot camps, and some of the data is not just you know, the New Jersey data, but data from around the country. Do you see any hope in using boot camps, or is it your view that it's a waste of time and resources and we ought to get rid of them and move on to other approaches? I wouldn't necessarily say that it's a, a complete waste of time. Part of the problem um, with boot camps is that they've had some fairly unrealistic expectations heaped on their shoulders. And I'm sure you can attest to this as well, that it's, it's difficult to expect um, a program that maybe has 60, 70 beds to achieve any you know, substantive kind of drop in, in crime. It's very difficult to... Uh, but it was articulated as a model. I mean, you certainly, the numbers are the numbers, but it was suggested that if you put whatever number of kids you could in those camps, that that would serve as a model way to use a horrible word, to rehabilitate them or to get them ready to reintegrate into society, and that hasn't proved out. Is there any reason to keep them in those camps? Well, under certain circumstances, one of them is that horrible word that you just mentioned is rehabilitation, and that uh, most of the research shows that those boot camps that do achieve a, a drop in recidivism are those that are linked up with a fairly well-developed rehabilitation program uh, and linked up with, with aftercare as well. And it's, it's just not you know, the waking kids up at 5 o'clock and making them do push-ups. And in and of itself really doesn't uh, achieve that kind of reduction. Was that so part of the New Jersey model? Uh, Howard would, would probably be a better one to ask about that. There's, the problem is that there's so much variation in what these programs look like. But Many it programs. Like it's not the boot, what we think of as a boot camp is, for anybody who's never been in the military or seen it on television, is early wake-ups, high discipline, lots of push-ups and physical training, and a pretty military-oriented way of going about showing deference and being in a structured environment. Well, well it is a structured environment, and it is early wake-up, mm -hmm. but it, it, is, it is teaching respect, it is giving respect, it is getting respect back, and it's, and it's based, and I guess perhaps the most important thing that we do in the, in the commission is built on the foundation of education. When, we, when you attend one of our graduations, and I invited Mr. Brown to do that, um, we many times uh, have kids go up anywhere from two, sometimes four to six grade levels. That's something that we give the kid and can never take it away from him. But see, we, I think in the tape uh, material that you showed at the top of the program, you indicated that there's a, a pretty good two-level jump that's surprisingly high for kids who went through boot camp. The question is whether the promise that was held out that the discipline would carry over in a way that would keep these kids out of trouble more than a year down the road doesn't seem to be happening. If there's a strong educational component, maybe we need to do more educational work with juveniles throughout the, the system. But the question is whether or not this other kind of military discipline, which was, as the professor said, sold as kind of a panacea six or seven years ago, whether that adds anything meaningful to the mix. Well, I think it does add meaningful. I think we have, we have taken that discipline and we have coupled it into a very caring uh, environment where the kids really are not threatened each and every day that they, they wake up. I mean, we do not touch the kids. We have a very, very um, controlled program so that there, there is actually a very close bond that is built between the kids and the drill instructors that I think is very unique to New Jersey. Thank goodness you have not heard any of the complaints 
that have ex that have been experienced in other parts of the country have been experienced here in New Jersey because I think we do it differently. And I think it's built with the structure and with compassion and with understanding that uh, that the kid or the, or the resident is going back to the streets and that we want him to feel better about himself and be successful. Now, which is what I wanted to talk about before is how do we do that? Well, like anything, uh, you, you need to have a component. We recognize in the commission that if we're going to be successful, all the great work we do inside has to be carried to the outside, that we have to bring our message of what we do in the commission into the communities, to, to meet with the communities and with the leaders of those communities and with the education departments and with the police chiefs and the prosecutors. Now, we had the attorney general here four or five years ago on this program saying that he thought the key to any work with juveniles was aftercare. That's really the same thing that we're discussing now. So the question is, as you've looked at programs like this around the country and done a study, what led you to be critical of the boot camp idea? Um, there, there are a number of things that, that need to be cleared up with, with that. First of all, uh, the boot camps, in addition to the, to the reduction in recidivism, it's, it's treated as an alternative to incarceration, essentially. Uh, so that it makes the assumption that the, the kids or even adults that go to a boot camp otherwise would have gone to prison. And that's probably been one of the, 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 the biggest problems with boot camps to date is that many of the people who go to these programs probably were not on their way to prison uh, or, or a juvenile institution. Rather, but in New Jersey, let me just stop you for a minute. In New Jersey, a lot of the people who went to the boot camps probably would have been in jail as an alternative, wouldn't they? It would have been in a more secure environment, yes. I'm sorry, that's a preventive. I interrupted you. No, that's, a, that's right. You see, see again, there, the, the screening criteria that often go on, it's, it's generally you know, young boys convicted of nonviolence with nonviolent histories. And what so do you think we're somewhat feeling about this idea? I mean, what led to this momentum for an idea that doesn't seem to have panned out overall in terms of its effect on the city? Uh, I, I think the military model is just kind of gels with us psychologically to a certain extent. We, we seem to have faith in that. And that, and it just came on the heels of a, of a general kind of movement to get tough and, and, and step up the punishments a bit more. If your emphasis is going to be increasingly on follow-up, I know at some point you had to sit back and say to yourself, well, I can do follow-up and then sort of expand that and get rid of the boot camp idea, or I can keep the boot camp and add it, supplement the follow-up. When you had that conversation with yourself or your other advisors, what made you decide that it was boot camp plus follow-up, as opposed to just jettisoning boot camp and starting with a more intensive kind of work inside and out with juveniles? Well, because I believe if you go to the boot camp, you see it working each and every day. You see kids come in looking one way, uh, whether they come in overweight um, and not thinking very positively about themselves, turn around, lose weight, get into shape. Um, some times they can't read, they, learn, they can't, then they learn to read, they learn to write letters. I mean, that is an amazing thing for, for, to, for a young person to, to gain during a period of, of, in, of incarceration. Well, why wouldn't we want to build on that? I, if it's something that works while they're with us, we should never turn back or turn our backs on the kids. What we have to do is build on that and make the next step work. I like to always use the example of you're driving down the turnpike and you know that you're not supposed to speed, but you do. And then you come past a terrible accident and you see people laying in the middle of the road, maybe even screaming, maybe waiting for the jaws of life. And you go, oh my God, look what happened. I'm going to slow down. And I slow down for maybe five minutes, and then you look down at your speedometer again, and you're speeding again. Why do you do that? Well, you have to be reminded constantly of what is important. And I think that's what we have going here. It's not that these kids don't want to do good. I think they need to be reminded. They need the support. They need the reassurance that what they have come out of is okay. worth building on. Let me break this down a little bit. It's apparent that a boot camp can instill a certain amount of discipline on the spot while the young man is in the environment in which he's got role models and you got somebody screaming at him when he messes up uh, and imposing immediate discipline, even if it's push-ups. Um, what happens six months, a year down the road when he hasn't been able to do in that to him for a year? That is, is it, are these skills, skills that translate into the real word, world where the decisions will be more shades of gray and there'll be no adult standing over and screaming at him? Well, I don't think it's necessarily screaming at him. And I don't think you necessarily have to scream at kids to get them to do things that you well, want to do. Well, there's a fair amount of screaming that takes place in a boot camp. But, I mean, let's – clearly there is a direct and immediate disciplinary response that's part of the boot camp process. Right. Okay. That doesn't ha ha happen a year or so after kids out. How do you ensure or what can you do to 
make the discipline that's acquired in that environment carried over to the real world. Well, I, that's what I'm saying. I think that we, we, we have to build with the families that we're looking to bring f the families into the boot camp to be a part of the process. Um, if there is not a strong family base, I think we have to look at the faith community to help mentor along the, the child when they come back to, to the society that they have left. I think we have to work with boys and girls clubs, with police departments. We have to work with small business organizations. We have to get the, the community involved in what we did. We have taken your young children, your children rather, for six months. We have changed them. We have gone through a paradigm shift. Okay. Come, now, now it's your turn. Well, let's change. It's your turn to pick up the Let ball. me test your confidence in the new power paradigm shift. A couple of years ago when we last touched this subject and visited some boot camps, there was talk about opening some more in addition to the one we've been discussing. Is that still on the agenda? Are you sufficiently confident that this is working that you want to open more? Well, I, I mean, there's always budgetary uh, concerns that right now we are in you know, very difficult budgetary times. Do, do I believe that it could bigger is, and more is better? I'm not saying that. Well, but it's a priority. I mean, obviously, one of the challenges of your job is to make priority judgments. Right. In terms of, I'm testing in a crude way the intensity of your belief in the boot camp by saying, it sounds like you're committed to this one because you believe it works and it's a good thing. Are you committed enough to say, what I want to do next is to have more, to have more kids in boot camp by opening another one, or two or three, because that's what was being talked about right. two years ago. Well, I, I believe it could be expanded, it could be enlarged. I don't know if I would want to develop more boot camps, because I, I, I recognize that there's limits to everything. I think there is a place for a secure environment, like we have at the training school in Monroe Township. I think there is a place for our residential programs. I think there is a place for transitional programs, which we're going to go to in the aftercare process. I think we are, you know, we're almost like a domino set, and the dominoes all have to fit together neatly to make this process work for our young people. Okay. Now, domino theory is dangerous, so I'm going to stay away from the professor, but <laughs> it does seem that, that, that Mr. Byer has the same kind of priority issue as that any other government official has, but in a critical area. Where does he spend his money? Um, what should he be doing in lieu of boot camp with the resources at his disposal? Uh, other places around the country have developed uh, what are have been commonly being called uh, the community-based correctional facility, which is essentially a, a secure residential facility uh, without the military component. Uh, and so it, it delivers many of the same types of services, and it has a shorter term of incarceration. And so that's that's part of the problem in trying to evaluate the effectiveness of a boot camp program. Is it is it the fact that you you might be getting a different set of kids to run through there, maybe there are better risks anyway. Are these facilities producing better results in terms of recidivism? They tend to be, yes, they tend to be producing better results in terms of recidivism relative to the traditional juvenile detention scenario. How about relative to the boot camp? I mean, that's oh, what we're talking I'd about. Yeah, I'd yet to see any, any, anything setting those two up. And that, that's part of the problem with, with, with a proposal to expand the use of boot camps is that really we, we don't have enough information about the conditions under which they're going to be effective consistently. We just don't know that yet. And so I think it would just be um, a bit risky uh, to, to expand it. It suggests that much of the discussion then about the boot camp in the past has been so loose and so free from any real strong look at who gets in and how they're run that it hasn't been a responsible discussion. I, I would agree with that, yeah. I, I think many of these decisions get, get, get made on speculation as opposed to firm empirical evidence about does it work or doesn't it work? Or, or, or probably the, the better question is how well does it work relative is to the other country moving away or towards boot camp in your view? Uh, I think they're probably moving away from it. I think the, the love affair with it happened about five or ten years ago. I think it's starting to fade. Well, that's just Howard Byers' love. Uh, five years from now, you now have 72 beds. How many will there be in Jersey five years from now? I, I, there will be at least 72 beds. At least 72. There will be at least 72 beds. And I think that one of the things that are very unique about uh, the commission is that we, we do have 30 a, seconds. All right, we have a research okay. unit, and we're not afraid to look at ourselves. One of the reasons why you can talk about how positive or negative we were doing is because we did look at ourselves. We see where our shortcomings are, and we're willing to make the improvements that are necessary to do better. And we're going to continue to do that. Well, after your next study, we'll see how the dominoes have fallen and we'll Absolutely. revisit this issue. I want to right. thank you both for being with us. That's it for this edition of Due Process, but we'll be back here next week with another in-depth look at law and social justice. Till then, for Sandy King and all of us here at Due Process, I'm Raymond Brown. Thanks for watching.
Jersey State Bar Foundation, committed to educating the public about the law. Additional funding is provided by Lawyer's Diary and Manual, 